Confieso con Carlos. Shrew be clapping for them.
also need to be a factor of associated with adherence to DRT, which can be targeted in interventions. So, in conclusion, more needs to be done in the area of mental health or peer HIV, integration of mental health and HIV services, needs to be prioritized, and we need more studies. So these are the abstracts we have for this uh, uh, session. And, uh, we will take them as uh, we haven't seen one of the presenters, but uh, you know, the presenter comes to the table. Um, I don't know, for those of you that are from Nigeria, you may be familiar with this, uh, this slide as a thank you. Uh, I got it from a very good friend of mine who was at the last class and is not here right now. Uh, for those from Nigeria, you will relate to this is a slide. This is a slide very popular. I mean, this view is popular in the countryside. So, welcome to this session, and um, I'm sure it will be an interesting session uh, as we share our experiences across the continent on uh, mental health and HIV. Um, I'm going to go ahead to introduce the first speaker. And, uh, you will have 10 minutes so we can get some time for discussion at the end. So let me invite Karen Webb to come up, please introduce yourself, and then um, go ahead. You should give me a round of applause. <laughs> Good morning. So excited to be here. I'm so glad that uh, everybody's come. My name is Karen Webb. And I'm the Knowledge Management and Impact Analysis Director, long term, um, at the Organization for Public Health Interventions and Development. Uh, and we are at uh, FAR through USAID for the clinical care partner uh, for the Ministry of Health and Child Care at about 660 health facilities across the country. So, and we're very grateful to be here on behalf of my open co authors and Ministry of Health and Child Care co authors to uh, talk to you about the results of a scoping exercise about the integration of mental health into HIV services in Zimbabwe. So as a bit of a background, I think it's mostly been covered by the prof, but uh, in Zimbabwe, we have uh, an HIV prevalence of 14.1%, uh, and this translates to about 1.2 million people living with HIV. And when you think in the context of approximately half of all people living with HIV, um, in Zimbabwe presenting for mental health services or also present, presenting for HIV services and, and that people living with HIV are more likely to experience mental disorders. So in a very progressive move, the Zimbabwean Ministry of Health and Child Care has implemented uh, measures within the operational and service delivery standards for HIV care and treatment, uh, which advocate for annual mental health screening uh, in HIV care. And this is a very simple two-step process that starts with asking two basic questions. And if you answer yes, then you move on to a screening. Or if you have an, another red flag, which could be a high viral load um, or uh, express non-adherence issues. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Uh, and so I mentioned about COVID being uh, USAID's clinical care partner in Zimbabwe. So we cover about 60% of the country at public health facilities. And so within this context, uh, we're intended to support Ministry of Health and Child Care to implement the program as per guidelines, so the implementation of the delegated program. So within this context, we wanted to conduct a scoping exercise within our program to inform future program activities about how mental health screening is going, is it being done as recommended, um, and what are the existing human resource, resources available within HIV care. Uh, to support people living with HIV who access care to receive mental health screening and support. So moving straight to the lessons learned, because there's quite a few of them, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussions afterwards. So in the districts that we surveyed at the time of, of the scoping exercise, we're serving approximately 425,000 people living with HIV in care. And within all of those areas, uh, there were only three clinical psychiatrists identified. So if you do the ratios uh, among people living with HIV, it's rather abysmal. And that, in addition to these psychiatrists serving the general population. The good news is, is that Ministry of Health and Child Care through the Mental Health Unit has been trying to decentralize uh, mental health services and putting in place uh, additional cutters 
So part of this uh, involves mental health district focal persons, which are based at the district level. And 75% of the districts that we surveyed had these um, people in place. And perhaps more encouragingly, but there's a bit of a caveat here, is 92% indicated that they had nurses trained in mental health um, operating within their districts in post, which is encouraging. But if we dig a little deeper and look at where those nurses are placed, we found that three quarters of the mental health nurses in place were in one district. Uh, Bulawayo was an urban district, and the reason for this is that because it has a large psychiatric hospital. Um, but as we know, the majority of people living with HIV in Zimbabwe and in many other African countries uh, live in rural areas. And in those rural areas, there are very few uh, nurses or other um, health care providers that are trained in mental health. So, and those that are in care, are, are in, operating in care, are not necessarily working within HIV care environments. And then moving forward, so that we have this recommended mental health screening in clinical care. So we asked at the district level with district medical officers and health authorities, are we currently screening um, clients in HIV care as recommended in the OSDM? Only 37% of the districts indicated they were currently doing this, even though it has been recommended for a number of years within the guidelines. But it's not just good enough to identify a gap. We need to know if not, why not? And what's the reason that we're not doing this? And we're actually quite surprised because we thought it might be um, issues of non, not enough personnel in terms of what, what's the key issue? What do we really need to get at? And what we found was healthcare worker confidence for mental health screening and, and support is really low within HIV care environments. And this is a big step because if a healthcare worker is not confident to provide quality treatment, um, they're going to be less likely to provide it. As noted by one of the district health uh, authorities that were was involved in a stakeholder interview, said nurses and facilities are not capable of mental health screening, even if they use the guidelines. They're uncomfortable and they fear misdiagnosing clients. So people aren't sure, one, how to screen, how to use the screening tool effectively, and then two, what to do after somebody screens positive. And then where they were using the screening tool, tool, so you can see that we're going getting progressively more granular as we go in terms of scoping. So where the screening tool was being used, we want to say, okay, well, how's it going? What are the outcomes? Is it being implemented with fidelity as the ministry has recommended? Well, the unfortunate the reality is that the only part of the mental health cascade that we currently have data on um, within HIV care, and I think otherwise, is our denominator is the number of people living with HIV in care. We have no data on the coverage of mental health screening, uh, where it is happening, the proportion that's screened positive, um, those that receive the formal assessments, and the outcomes. What care do they receive? Do they receive the appropriate care? So there's work to do with data, um, building the data. And then um, we really believe that in terms of making doing this no-do gap, overcoming the translation of policy to practice. It's really important to understand what health system stakeholders think about what the barriers are and what the facilitators are. So we do this in, in an open-ended kind of way. We have the structured questionnaire for the other part, and then we had an open-ended section in which we really wanted to explore what do you think the barriers are to integrating mental health within HIV services? So this is not just using the screening tool. It's truly integrating a supportive quality of care of mental health. And these are the key themes that resulted. One is client vulnerability. So there was a very uh, keen sense that those who are most likely to have mental health problems within HIV care are the least likely to be able to access care um, by traveling, getting transport to go to the district level or going to the provincial level to receive the care that's required. And this speaks to the lack of referral services at community level. We're really saying we need something in our communities. And then, of course, something that we've heard a lot this week and talked about a lot this week is st existing stigma and discrimination both in the community and in the facility in some instances. And then the availability of guidelines, not just on how to screen, but what to do after somebody screens positive. Availability of medications and, importantly, the confidence of nurses to prescribe. We went through this with ART, didn't we, in terms of um, decentralizing uh, art initiation. 
And I think the same needs to happen um, with mental health. And then an interesting thing that came up that we didn't anticipate was that health system stakeholders indicated that health <laughs> for mental health could be a barrier to quality of care of screening uh, within HIV service environments. So these healthcare workers live and exist and face the same vulnerabilities as their clients in many communities. And so if they're not coping well, if they don't feel supported and they're having problems within their own life, um, the health system stakeholders were saying, how best are they fit um, to support other clients? And we don't want to just focus on barriers. We also want to look at facilitators because there are many. We do have capacity. Um, at the HIV programs in many countries, including Zimbabwe, is very strong. And we've got a strong workforce and, and very skilled workers. So decentralized, decentralized, decentralized. We, we couldn't be said enough. It was permeated basically everything. We, have, we actually had to say, okay, well, what else? What else do we need to do? Um, and as mentioned, upskilling of existing cadres. So this is not just <coughs> bringing the mental health trained workers into the HIV sphere, but we also have um, primary counselors and other um, groups in Zimbabwe that provide HIV test counseling and adherence counseling that could be further upskilled for mental health. And then finally, to activate the existing community-based uh, groups for support, we have support groups um, and to train these specifically in mental health screening support. And integrating tools for documentation was another key thing. They said, please, not another register. I'm sure this resonates with a lot of you in your setting. When we bring in a new program, we can't introduce a completely additional set of tools. So the healthcare system stakeholders are saying, if we're going to integrate with, in reality, in an effective way, we really have to make sure that it's within the existing tools and not another register. And then finally, to strengthen ART and mental health from one of the chains. Um, healthcare workers are very hesitant to initiate any kind of treatment, whether that's ART or um, a medication for depression, if they don't know that there's going to be uh, availability of that in the future. So finally, I think I can go through this quickly because, so we got the what. What do we need to do now from this scoping exercise as our next steps? We think there's four key things that we need to do. Uh, and that's decentralized the services to primary health care level. Um, and Dr. El uh mentioned this yesterday in plenary, and it's quite a mouthful, pragmatic algorithmic approaches for non-specialists. And this is really just using simple evidence-based tools and guidance for stepped care, if-then kind of things. What do you do if somebody screens positive? Because it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of situation. And then we need to map our resources at district level, and upskill um, those groups in place rather than introducing parallel programs. And we have the what, and now we need to look at the how. We can't just identify what needs to be done. We need to be systematic and strategic and in achieving this. And the two main things that we're doing is looking at meaningful integrated partnerships. Um, this integration isn't for one organization, one unit, one anything to do. It's to be achieved together. So. Uh, we've developed a coalition in Zimbabwe we're calling Kushandira uh, Pamwe, which in Shona is we come together or we cooperate together. So it's bringing both HIV and mental health practitioners, academics, Ministry of Health units together uh, to work towards this common goal. And then finally, we need to strengthen data for decision making. There's gaps in the cascade that we should fill, and by doing that, uh, we continue to improve quality. I'd like to thank um, the Ministry of Health and Child Care and Pet Farm for USA to the Face HIV program and our collaborating partners. Thank you, Karen. So we'll take the question of the paper. Um, it's fit here and yet.
donne l'opportunité de présenter les résultats de nos travaux qui ont porté sur la prévalence et les facteurs associés à la détresse psychologique sur la population qui est au niveau. C'est une étude que nous avons menée en 2017. En introduction, nous disons que les troubles de santé mentale constituent un enjeu majeur de santé publique dans le monde. Ces troubles ont été identifiés comme des contributeurs, ont été identifiés comme des facteurs contribuant à l'ampleur de l'épidémie du VIH, notamment chez les populations clés. Des études ont été par exemple menées chez les hommes ayant des rapports sexuels avec d'autres hommes, euh, présentant une dépression qui ont montré que ceux-ci étaient engagés dans des comportements à risque, notamment les rapports sexuels non protégés et l'abus de substances. Cependant, ce qu'il faut noter, c'est que la thématique de la santé mentale est largement négligée chez les populations qui en Afrique subsaharienne où le fardeau de l'épidémie du VIH est le plus élevé. Nous avons donc mené une étude pour, avec pour objectif d'estimer la prévalence et de décrire les facteurs associés à la détresse psychologique chez les hommes ayant des rapports sexuels avec d'autres hommes, les professionnels du sexe et les usagers de drogue au Togo en 2017. Nous avons donc mené une étude transversale d'août à septembre 2017 dans huit principales villes du Togo. Ont été inclus des participants qui avaient plus de 18 ans, qui vivaient au Togo au moins pendant trois mois avant la réalisation de l'enquête et qui était en possession d'un coupon de l'étude. Nous avons utilisé un questionnaire standardisé pour le recueil des données sociodémographiques ainsi que sur la consommation d'alcool et la consommation de tabac. L'échelle de Kessler à 10 questions a été utilisée pour l'évaluation de la détresse psychologique. Des prélèvements sanguins ont également été réalisés. Pour le, test du, pour le dépistage du VIH qui a été réalisé au laboratoire de l'OIM à l'Université de Lomé. En fonction du score obtenu à l'échelle de Kessler, nous avons regroupé les participants en quatre catégories, à savoir ceux qui avaient des traits psychologiques sévères, modérés, faibles ou l'absence de des traits psychologiques. Nous avons regroupé les patients aux participants dans les, dans les groupes de traits psychologiques modéré et sévère, parce que dans le dernier groupe de détresse psychologique sévère, il y avait que 11 participants. Des analyses descriptives et multivariées ont été réalisées, avec une variable dépendante à présent de détresse psychologique pour un score supérieur ou égal à 20. Cette étude a été approuvée par le comité de bioéthique pour la recherche en santé du ministère en charge de la santé au Togo. Et chaque participant avait fourni un consentement écrit avant d'être inclus dans l'étude. Au total, 2044 participants ont été recrutés, dont 449 usagers de drogue, 972 professionnels du sexe et 643 hommes ayant des rapports sexuels avec deux hommes. Dans la population d'études, nous avons observé que 45,2% des participants avaient déclaré qu'ils avaient une consommation excessive d'alcool. Parmi les usagers de drogue, cette proportion était de 67,7%, et chez le professionnel du sexe, elle était de 45,4%. La prévalence globale du VIH dans la population étudiée était de 13,7%, et chez les usagers de drogue, elle était de 3,6%, et de 21,6% chez les hommes ayant des rapports sexuels avec eux. En ce qui concerne la détresse psychologique, la prévalence globale était de 39% dans la population étudiée. La détresse psychologique sévère a été retrouvée chez 32,1% des usagers de drogue et 19% chez les professionnels du sexe. Nous avons également noté que le niveau de détresse psychologique augmentait avec l'âge chez les participants de notre étude. Par ailleurs, chez les participants présentant une détresse psychologique modérée à sévère, près de la moitié avait un niveau d'instruction équivalent au primaire. Le niveau de détresse psychologique était également associé à la consommation d'alcool, de tabac et à l'infection du VIH. Ainsi donc, les participants présentant une détresse psychologique modérée à sévère, 
Parmi les patients, c'est conseillé qu'il y ait le 4 avec une consommation excessive d'alcool, 17,6 étaient, étaient des fumeurs, 17,6 étaient infectés par le VIH. En analyse multivariée, nous avons noté que avant plus de 25 ans, avant une consommation excessive d'alcool et être infecté par le VIH, étaient les facteurs associés à la détresse psychologique. Ainsi, donc, dans notre étude, au total, 39% des populations présentaient une détresse psychologique. Cependant, peu d'études sont menées sur la santé mentale auprès des populations clés en utilisant par exemple les chaînes de Kessler en Afrique subsaharienne. Les études menées en Afrique subsaharienne qui ont utilisé les chaînes de Kessler ont été effectuées en population générale en Afrique du Sud et au Nigeria chez les personnes vivant avec le VIH et ont rapporté des prévalences respectives de 23,9% et 47,9%. Les mêmes facteurs associés, notamment la consommation excessive d'alcool et le statut cognitif pour le VIH ont été retrouvés comme des facteurs associés dans ces deux études. La prévalence des troubles de santé mentale sont variés variables en fonction du sport ou du questionnaire utilisé. Ainsi donc, chez les, chez les hommes et en des rapports sexuels avec d'autres hommes, la détresse psychologique modérée à sévère, la prévalence de la détresse psychologique modérée à sévère était de 22% aux États-Unis avec les chaînes de Kessler et de 37% en Inde en utilisant le questionnaire pour la prévalence de la dépression. Chez les professionnels du CEP, la prévalence de la dépression est estimée à 79,2% en République dominicaine. Cependant, notre étude avait quelques limites, à savoir que nous avons étudié les trois populations simultanément, mais il est possible que le professionnel du sexe soit un usager de drogue ou qu'un homme ayant des rapports sexuels avec d'autres hommes soit également un usager de drogue. Notre étude était également basée sur les données déclaratives, donc les données de mémoire et de prévarication ne sont pas à exclure. En conclusion, nous disons donc que la vie psychologique était plus fréquente chez les usagers de drogue et les professionnels du sexe au Togo. L'âge, la consommation excessive d'alcool et l'infection du VIH étaient positivement associés à la détresse psychologique. Comme suggestion, nous, nous avons proposé au ministère de la Santé, santé d'inclure le dépistage des troubles de santé mentale, et de les intégrer au paquet de soins qui est proposé aux populations clés pour que la prise en charge au bas soit plus effective. Nous terminons notre propos en adressant nos remerciements à toutes les équipes qui nous ont accompagnés. Et nous vous remercions pour votre attention. Merci. My name is uh, Michael Bailey. I'm a mental health professional working on the Ministry of Health, but also I'm a graduate student in the University of Malawi. Um, my uh, presentation is focusing on the the impact of the integration of depression screening and treatment program in Dukuruji HIV care on, um, on HIV as well as on mental health outcomes uh, in Malawi.
the um, the UN is according to date of uh, 2018, um, the H the preference of HIV um, in Malawi is around uh, 9.2%, and uh, Malawi is uh, committed to the 1990 target. And with that, um, they adopted the test and treat strategy. However, um, attrition across the, um, the HIV care continuum remains a challenge. And um, depression appears to be a significant uh, barrier to HIV um, care. And uh, one in three, between one in three and uh, one in six people living uh, with HIV in Africa also have uh, uh, mild to severe uh, depression. And this is uh, even affected more in uh, areas where uh, access to mental health care is a challenge. And uh, just to, um, to explain more on how uh, depression can affect HIV, uh, HIV care is that uh, most of the symptoms of the HIV of uh, depression, like loss of interest, poor concentration, fatigue, suicidality, as well as hopelessness, affect uh, as an impact on motivation, as well as self efficacy which tends to lead to uh, poor adherence, as well as reduced uh, appointment uh, to, to the clinic. And this definitely affects education as well as suppression. So successful uh, management of um, successful management of depression leads to um, an improved adherence as well as education in care. So um, our program was um, it was a pilot program which was done in two um, primary healthcare clinics within the central region of Malawi, and um, we only focused on um, um, screening as well as uh, management. And we had two uh, phases, the control phase, that was the screening phase, as well as the um, intervention phase. And we used the patient health questionnaire online to do the screening of uh, uh, the patients. And um, this was done on all newly initiated patients. And our objectives were to assess the feasibility of integrating um, depression screening as well as management in uh, primary health care clinics, but also to evaluate its impact on uh, um, health outcomes, especially on depression and uh, um, HIV. So it was the standard um, um, interventions. We had a um, screening phase, the baseline, where we did it. Uh, in, um, in 2017 and in 2018, we started our um, active uh, intervention phase. So, those uh, in screening, they were just getting uh, in the control phase, they were just getting standard care. While in the interventions, we had trained uh, ART clinicians and uh, nurses to um, on how to um, manage depression care um, using um, measure based um, care, which was adopted. So um, the, H, uh, the HTC counselors would uh, use what we call PHU2 to screen the patients, and then um, during the initiation, the ART initiation, the ART nurse or the ART clinician would do the, um, the PHU9, full PHU9 screening, and then. Um, they are given standard depression care. They were either referred to um, a mental health nurse or a mental health clinician. But in the intervention phase, these um, ART care providers were capacitated to provide care within the ART clinic. But also, we had uh, trained um, community health care workers in uh, what we call friendship bench counseling, as a problem solving uh, therapy, which was adopted from. So it was um, one baseline design, and uh, we, uh, we did this study among the consenting others, uh, 
uh, within the HIV clinics, and we have extracted data from the electronic medical records. So, what are our findings uh, from uh, this study? The first key uh, findings are that near all patients uh, who, were, who came to the analytic clinic were screened for depression. And uh, you see that we had a uh, total of 2,440 patients, and out of that, we had uh, 2,067 who were and then we had completed uh, 96 percent in terms of screening. And uh, with regards to um, uh, depression itself, mild well, depression, we had 19 percent, and um, those with moderate to severe, we had 6 percent, and those with severe. So we had around uh, 24 point something or prevalence of depression among uh, this population. So, in terms of analysis, we analyzed the, uh, those who had depression about 502, um, and uh, we had um, a good number of female, which was represented by 57%. And um, in terms of uh, Mild depression, we had 371 of them had mild depression, while uh, moderate to severe, we had 126. And the baseline, in terms of the uh, suicidality, we had 79% uh, who had no thoughts of suicide, but we had 21% who had thoughts of suicide. In terms of key finding number two, um, near everyone who, uh, who was um, Found to have depression, we have started on treatment and received uh, uh, sustained treatment of depression for the period of the study. So, in terms of friendship bench, uh, we have 86% of, uh, uh, of the participants who, uh, who received uh, this uh, therapy. And um, in terms of moderate to severe, we had uh, 96% who received antidepressant. And um, in terms of sustaining um, uh, the treatment for depression, we had uh, those who had received friendship for more than uh, three sessions, we had 54, uh, 42%. And uh, those who had uh, received antidepressant for three months, more than three months, we had 11%. In terms of uh, Key finding number three is that uh, exposure to depression treatment program did not uh, improve HIV data or uh, depression outcomes. Um, we compared the, the, um, the control group and uh, the intervention group, they're almost similar. And um, in terms of uh, adjusted, adjusted ones, and adjusted and adjusted. It was almost the same um, uh, finding. So, what were the implementation challenges? Um, one of the uh, most uh, uh, implementing challenge was uh, integration into the EMR. Since uh, the ART uh, management was done using the EMR, while well, the integration management was, uh, was not uh, part of the EMR. So, follow up to patients. Who might have missed um, were not taken on board, but also at the same time um, the validity, the fidelity of um, <coughs> the providers and uh, screening patients uh, using the PHQ nine and six months uh, was a challenge, and also we had frequent uh, number of um, frequent medication stopouts within the two clinics. Um, and also, in terms of uh, the, uh, the friendship bench, it's supposed to be a, a weekly um, session for six weeks. However, in, in our case, we, we did it for, um, we're doing it monthly. This probably affected um, um, the, the results. And also, availability of counselors, we have used, uh, we currently do not have uh, uh, as social counselors. And we used um, community health care workers who already have their own um, duties. So it affected the, in terms of uh, the other ability to cancel patients. So um, some of the standard limitations includes, included uh, crossover between groups from uh, control 
transmission. Um, but also, uh, we have certain transfers between uh, the two regions because of uh, about five kilometers away. And um, in terms of um, outcomes, we looked at only six months outcomes in terms of the availability of the plants who came to the clinics. And um, this is um, now what we have reflections on. Um, on the study. Integrating um, depression screening and management is feasible um, in HIV care. What needs to be done is to uh, make sure that uh, um, medications are available, they, the staff are fully capacitated, and they're supposed to be frequent refreshers, and also close monitoring of the evaluation of the program. Uh, maintaining treatment over time was a challenge, and that could have uh, impacted improvement in the outcomes. And um, because this one was an implementation science uh, study, uh, we didn't uh, have much control on the, on the clinic, uh, the way they were the staff, because they were in their new world setting, they didn't have much of the research uh, assistance as part of the so I would like to thank my collaborators as well as the participants and the funders uh, for the, the program. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Let me call upon And I know I think she will it's better for her to understand. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and others coming from the last session. I should organize others. Yeah, my situation. Okay, um, what I think I'm for the land, and one. Um, I hold PhD in program evaluation and certified uh, cancer psychotherapy. And currently, I lead with gender, human rights, and health services for the National Agency for AIDS, NACA, and for AIDS, NACA, in Nigeria. So, my presentation is on the integration of mental health with the new HIV and AIDS community care and support guidelines in Nigeria. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of the team. My director, Mr. Ernest, will be very seated, and my colleague, and he that is, we work together on this. Yeah, as a form of background, I'm sure we've seen this slide uh, in several places during the course of the conference, but I'll just want to call and nice the fact of the population of Nigeria in Africa, we know, it's quite huge, and for HIV, we have. Uh, Estimated about 2 million, 1.9 estimated from our last survey in 2018. Um, men who are sex with men, sex workers, um, persons who inject drugs constitute a huge number of the population of people living with HIV and AIDS and um, are epidemic in highly feminized. Great number of women, almost double of men, are positive. We also have a large volume of TB, and uh, mental health privilege in the country is also key. The country, as you know, is divided into six geopolitical zones, uh, which is depicted by the picture. Yeah, from the Nairobi, I'm also sure we've seen this as a number of presentations on our national. Um, Indicator and impact uh, survey, which we will be con concluded in 2018. The survey was quite huge and it revealed the number of things to, to take forward in the, in the response. And the fact that, uh, yes, the epidemic might be, uh, the privilege might be coming down, but uh, we have increasing number of uh, incidents 
of uh, HIV. And like I said, the epidemic is um, for females, it's all, almost double that of males. And then um, as uh, the years are um, progressing, you see more the increase in the prevalence. Yes, young persons, especially those between 35 to 39, are, are quite I, uh, the prevalence is quite high and uh, yeah, we know the over the age of HIV, that's why we're all here, about 40 million people are going to get it. And the first round uh, strategy for ending AIDS by 2030, the 1990 targets would not be achieved without um, serious consideration for all the elements that might be uh, uh, divine not from achieving the uh, Expected the third, particularly the third night, the virus suppression, where HIV and mental health are to be found to be very important and critical, which is the well being, the mental health, which is the state of well being, where every individual is present and able to, to uh, achieve their full potentials. And we know, and also cope with stresses of life, and we know HIV has a lot of burden and stress to individual lives. And um, the fact that it's a major uh, mental health consideration among uh, persons living with HIV. Particularly if you consider the data that uh, we report about one, point, about one out of four persons uh, have issues around mental health, and particularly in Africa, we have one in ten. And um, we all recognize that mental health condition is actually undiagnosed and untreated, especially among. Persons living with HIV. <coughs> Specifically, we have some studies in the country which call their attention to the fact that mental health is an area of uh, serious need. Um, like there was this study which found out that whilst we have uh, about 19.5% of uh, mental health condition among general population, for persons living with HIV, we have about 60%. And which is a very which is very huge and a big need and concern, validating some of the earlier findings. And specifically in the country, um, HIV have issues around depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and behavior, and attempted suicide, while a number of them have actually committed suicide. So we know from the negative effect of mental health, which includes complications with clinical care. This engagement from healthcare and non adherence, which is a very big issue for the top 90, and then HIV transmission. <laughs> so, it's really a big area for us to work on and um, uh, look at how we will do that. And it is also recommended by uh, WHO that MH should be integrated in the care, general care services of HIV and other. It's also, it's not just the uh, integration that like some of the earlier studies have revealed. We have to have standard way of routine diagnosis, ongoing and uh, basic and ongoing supportive counseling and psychosocial support, and some of them might also need psychiatric uh, need. We also, uh, the, the recommendation also includes uh, capacity strengthening for care workers who might not be able to ordinarily uh, and issues around them, uh, which would also be across all uh, 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 health workers, uh, across all workers, not just health workers. So for the country, there is a government commitment for the integration of mental health into the national HIV community care and support guidelines. Um, we saw that as a window, as a window of opportunity to tap into, because within the health sector, somehow a uh, number of Facility will be there around psychiatry services, but for PLHIV, they don't, might not even, it's not integrated within the psychiatry services. And also, the psychiatry services also have very limited uh, resources, like 1% of health uh, resources within the particular system. So, for us, the community care and support services provided the opportunity because it's a holistic, comprehensive, child focused, community centered care even by multidisciplinary team at all stages of care. So we believe at all stages, people should have skills to be able to diagnose the, 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 the presentation of MH cases and be able to refer, to be able to provide support appropriately 
because the objective of the um, of the care package, community care package, is to reduce the burden of the disease of the NHIV and father, to also improve quality of their lives and address medical, psychological, and social economic challenges as my affect them. For us within the community, the model is everybody is actually there. Um, from security agents to ministry to ministry in terms of in charge of education to healthcare workers to TV centers to community improvement teams, ministry of justice, um, ministries in charge of economic empowerment, the gender centers, they all work together and within the community we believe the civil society organizations, the community leaders, all the communities, they work together within the care community care support system. And during that, at any point, uh, MH is presented, there is a link for referral and the, the link for uh, proper screening. Within the guideline, there are a number of features which actually make it very good for us and uh, we have information about the standard of what those services should be, the linkages and adherence opportunities, the integration within that, Within that, we also uh, discovered we need to, within that system, we, uh, and the guideline, we have new uh, integration for mental health, especially also for TV, community interventions, for care support services, for KP. We are also having a class uh, session that we're thinking there could also be some level of engagement within the community around the fatalities and awareness campaign. Also, within it, we have indicators and truths track care and also some information about adherence and uh, retention in care. Before that, there was a process which led to this, which was solely funded by government of Nigeria. We had a review of our 2014 care support guideline, which revealed to us that MH is actually missing and along with some other um, components of work which we have integrated. We engage with multi-sectorial uh, partners who are uh, currently providing services. We also discovered that some of them, some partners and some federal partners are doing a number of interventions around MH. So we collected all of the interventions that they have and the strategies that we use and the technical uh, care support TWG works with the consultants to look at this and agree on the best approach to provide a service within the community can support. There was the validation of the document, and then there's the dissemination, and we are going on with capacity building for uh, service providers. One good thing to mention here is that we discovered when we were starting with a number of partner resources to not come with it because MH is not uh, a key element of the service provision yet, and when you prioritize a lot of priorities go, go, go into um, health components of the HIV and response. But we discovered as we progress, a number of partners are showing interest, they are keen into it, and they are ready to take it on in terms of bringing their resources for capacity strengthening for their providers and integration and use of um, the tool and the guidelines in service provision for, especially for mental health within their services. For us, key lessons learned, that it's very important we have government pragmatic leadership. This came solely from government, ideas of knowing that this is the key element of work that we have to resource in order to help us achieve the 1990. While we were also doing that, we benefited a lot of multi sectorial consultations. We also benefited, and that also was useful as an advocacy for mental health. And for people to it start incorporating and integrating mental health into the existing HIV and AIDS services. We also understand that there are available opportunities for integration into existing programs, like uh, Jane said about, uh, from Zimbabwe, that uh, we actually would not be looking at creating new programs, but looking at opportunities to integrate within whatever we are doing into uh, mental health, into whatever we are doing in order to achieve the program goals. In terms of conclusion and next steps for us, we know that uh, integration of mental health care package is very critical. For PNHIV, 
Baba and KPs as we work towards achieving the top 90. We also recognize the opportunities that are done within, for integration of MHD in HIV services, not necessarily um, creating new platforms. And we will be taking that forward by looking at what are the uh, manuals that are integrated within the testing um, uh, training packages, within the care services packages, within health facilities, because this is through a totally community end of uh, care and support packages. We also will be carrying out a lot of capacity training services for caregivers to deliver on mental health interventions, identification, psychosocial support, and also monitoring the use of the medicine by care and service providers and uh, tracking that and learning from it in order to move forward. Um, we have the references there. And um, I would love to acknowledge our CWG, the HIV care, community care support CWG members who were very, um, very uh, resilient in delivering this. The patient community were very active in all of the categories and classifications, including the transgender community in Nigeria were part of this. Um, we have developments and implementing partners, even if they do not put their resources, they all put their technical support and the federal government of Nigeria for resourcing this and giving the most. Thank you very much. from UNAIDS in Geneva. And I do think that mental health is often hugely underrepresented in, in some of the work that gives up. It's very nice to have a panel here in the abstract written session. And you laid out you know, the important pathways through which mental health can have a very direct bearing on HIV outcomes. But I was interested that in your evaluation, it was very difficult to show that your interventions had actually made a difference to HIV outcomes. And so I just want you to explore a little bit more some of the reasons why, despite a very plausible pathway, 
the interventions didn't seem to have a great impact on, on the very things like retention and as a kind of and that. Uh, I think it was my problem. Others could comment if they wanted as well, and it would aid them. Thank you very much, and uh, good day. Uh, so, my name is Anthony, obviously, from Nigeria. I, I worry about uh, kill bodies as we keep adding on things to get a and I am thinking, could there be other ways that we can get around the issue? Now we know that even some or most of the medicines we use in managing HIV have underlying challenges of adverse drug reaction. So, in providing access to these medicines, uh, how have we, as the people, uh, Integrated issue of adverse drug reaction monitoring and pharmacovigilance so that we can understand and uh, better use these medicines and which is best without uh, also which has the least, uh, least adverse drug reaction. Uh, we are talking about integrating HIV management and uh, non communicable diseases, diabetes. And we have these medicines that in cause our hyperglycemia, and we are using them. How do we study? How do we understand? How do we know how to use uh, these medications better? How do we integrate rather than integrating all this and increasing the field order? We increase our understanding. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll take just one more from here and then let us. Thank you very much for the presentations. I'm coming from the World Council of Churches, and we work in the continent of HIV, and we have identified these challenges of medicine. My question to all of you is how, in, in your research, whether you came across uh, any of the programs which are in conversation with faith communities to provide psycho-spiritual aspect of mental health. I'm asking this question particularly because I'm a caregiver of a daughter who has suffered from bipolar for many years. And her major frustration anytime we go through her sessions of treatment by a psychologist and uh, a psychiatrist is a missing element of discussing her faith issues. Um, obviously, we live in Switzerland, this is Western context, but I'm just wondering whether in our continent our faith issues are being taken into account. Also, because we have evidence of how some of the religious leaders are misusing faith to distract people from their treatments. And, and this has also a, a component that is driving people to mental health uh, because of the confusion that they are creating, particularly when people on air and base are discouraged from taking their medication simply because they have been prayed for and they have been promised healing and they have been told to throw away their treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for those questions. I will uh, ask you. Can I just respond to you? Sure you know, you <laughs> well, maybe I'll just respond to a couple of them. I'm not I qualified to respond to them all, um, <laughs> particularly around the use of selenium um, by the Minister of Health and Child Care. Right? Psychiatrist, so I need some expert advice on that. But I think that a lot of the comments were kind of overlapping, weren't they? Uh, and it starts with we don't want to um, overly medicalize this issue, but we also have to recognize that uh, we work with groups at uh, King's College and, and 
let us go hiding. And, and this, this idea of if you have a treatable disorder, um, if it was diabetes, and you had half of people uh, requiring diabetes treatment, and they didn't receive that treatment, it would be considered quite a major global public health issue. And mental health can be considered the same way, but I think the important messages that are coming across is that mental health um, isn't entirely biological. It's very much a social condition as well. And that uh, the steps care for depression uh, that we're working on, and I think that we're collectively working on, and it's great to hear, it's, we're, we're all together in this, is that it really starts with um, the first step should be support, psychosocial support within a community context. So I think it just, the challenge to us all is probably to very accurately map the faith-based communities, um, the available social support within and around the catchment areas of all of our health facilities. So we can make appropriate referrals that fit the needs of the individual, right? If the person's faith is important to them, then provide that with the linkage and referral and follow up and make sure that they receive that care. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the question. Really, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, in terms of um, um, some of the challenges with regards to our study, included a um, number of issues like um, general of staff or the trained in the, um, depression management. We had frequent turnovers, but also in terms of uh, depressant, we had frequent number of. Uh, Days we are not present. We are not there in the clinics. This affected uh, the, the clients who come, but we didn't uh, get the, 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 the medication. But also, as I said, uh, with regards to friendship bench, uh, they were meant to be receiving uh, counseling sessions every week. But because um, the, the nature of the clinics, the uh, ADRT clinics, are that they're supposed to be coming on a monthly basis. So, with that, they are getting the sessions. One month apart, which affected um, um, their uh, depression outcome. But also, um, in terms of the uh, the other team providers, they are heavily relying on the uh, EMR uh, in the other team provision. So the other aspect of uh, depression management was being forgotten. It, uh, it took uh, probably um, the the friendship page counselors to go and remind. Um, they are the providers that this one hasn't been screened. Uh, this time, they, uh, after after the first review, the second review, the, the FP council come and uh, remind the RRT provider uh, so that this uh, patient will be screened again. So those are some of the things which may have affected um, the outcomes. And this is a real world setting. We didn't have much control because we, we are working with the commissions in their um, clinical setting, and there was many more in terms of uh, research components. Thank you. Um, I will just talk about the coordinating because we actually played a uh, really laid the foundation well for the mental health component we're talking about, which is the laws around how to actually make the medicine work and uh, what each member of a very significant role in the life of a patient, the role they need to play. So for me, it's not about this issue of overburdening the system. It's not so much of funding the system, but how do we work efficiently to make the medication, the, all the uh, elements we're talking about, tie them together and ensure we have good results in terms of adherence, in terms of um, stopping transmission and um, invariably ending the virus. So, really, it's not so much of a low, it's actually looking at those missing elements that will make us achieve the result. And in terms of um, health, uh, religious groups, I believe the definition of actually psychosocial support takes a very strong uh, recognition of the religious, psycho spiritual elements of the patient. And uh, where the person is not able to uh, provide, there should be opportunity for referral. It is very important that it's a comprehensive package and the elements of it, they all tie together. And uh, that's why we're saying it's a lot around community services, it's a lot around empowering people to actually be able to identify and support. And for us, we also recognize the fact that 
mental health issues, psychological issues. It's a long term kind of um, support that the person will need. It's also not the usual system that you say if you give medication, it gets the result. It's actually to support the person in terms of adjustment, in terms of management, and in terms of living, living well. Now, as a result, uh, uh, if, uh, as you might be talking of adherence and stopping translation. I think those are the two. In terms of evaluation, we actually have a robust uh, kind of system coming up, which we have integrated. The indicators we want to track the, um, uh, the tools to be able to track it, and those are some of the things we are rolling out as we roll out the interventions within the community and working with the uh, facility components of the response. So does anyone want to respond on Selenium and the mental health? No one from here is capable. I think the person that raised the question is the next one. Can we give him the mic if he will share just a bit since we have some time? Just to keep it brief. So. Yes. If you go to the line, it's proven that the selenium helps against depression, anxiety, hostility, confusion, and stress. The reason, the significant reason that this happens in both HIV and Ebola is that because of HIV and both and Ebola both to keep selenium from the immune system and from the antioxidant system. When your antioxidant system is depleted, going to be more stressed and it affects the mood, etc. So it's just that Ebola does the same thing as HIV does. It takes HIV 10 years to deplete selenium. It takes Ebola 10 days to deplete selenium. The same symptoms occur and by supplementing selenium back in, you can reverse those moods. I'm not saying don't take antidepressants. You can anybody that wants to take antidepressants, they can. But I've been HIV positive for 36 years. I've never been sick. I've been with ARDs for 30 years and facility for 20 years, and I've never been depressed. Thank you. But I'm sure it's a linear plus some for that. Well, uh, uh, ARBs. I've been taking ARBs. And also some form of support. No, I support myself. I, I work there. <laughs> and so I support myself. I've been to 56 AIDS conferences all over the world. This is my 56. Wow. So uh, I've seen you in my whole pipeline. So I think we need to understand this disease better how HIV causes AIDS. That's what I've written, and that's what I've shared, tried to share with the papers that I've written. Because sometimes I think this virus is smarter than the people that are. We can suppress the virus, but ARBs directly do not do anything to increase the core count. It only allows the body to slowly regenerate. When you supplement solution back in, the immune system regenerates much faster. It's like putting the icing on the cake of ARBs. I'm the leading advocate for ARBs. But I would I would like some icing on my cake. ARBs are the cake, so then there's icing on the cake. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a quick comment from Dr. Anastasia yeah, as we round up. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda Hassan. I teach psychology uh, at the Nassau State University, and one of my very students currently is doing a lot of work with regards to suicidal ideation among the LHI. So this is a very important uh, issue that I think we need to work very well together to ensure that we deal with. Um, with regards specifically to what is the best approach, um, what I would advocate more of, particularly since um, we most of the communities we're talking about are resource constrained communities, is to ensure that counseling and psychosocial support is part of the entire value chain. I do not think that you can have a better replacement 
to counseling, to engagement. Um, and that, that's just a quick comment you know, I wanted to, uh, to add to the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Unfortunately, he stepped out already. That was oh. what I wanted him to get. Um, the issue of drugs, I think we tend to think that, forget that PLH HIV are human beings. There are non PLH HIVs that have to take many drugs. If you are diabetic, you are hypertensive, you have an infection, you, you have dialysis, you have to take supplements, and so many other things. So the issue of drug interaction should not be put in the side. You, as a practicing clinician, any day, any time, you must keep that in mind. And there are many software that can guide you. You may not be able to memorize all. So the, the, the take home on that issue is for every patient that is, you see, but in this context, for every HIV patient, check the prescription. In fact, food supplements have been out of interactions. So just check whatever medications you are prescribing that can be. I know you are talking about DTG, metformin, hypertension, so So, all these things, I think we need to, that's good clinical practice. You don't just prescribe drugs because you have another disease that has come. And we also know there are non pharmacological ways too, particularly for mental health issues and NCDs. So, those should not be left behind. I must give my co chair to tell me what. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think the conversation has been uh, very robust and very, very informative. I think that on your behalf and on behalf of everyone that is listening, I would say the panelists, the one who paid justice to the public issue, and also to everybody who has contributed in one way or another. Thank you very much. He is the UNFPA country rep for Ghana. Um, so, on behalf of the co chairs, and, um, all of you, we must thank them. You have actually shed light on mental health, and I'm sure after this conference, mental health issues around HIV will not remain the same. They will only move, and we must talk about integrating them. So, can you please join me to give them a round of applause? Thank you all very much. Thank you.